Hey everybody, welcome back to General Biochemistry Lecture. Still in Chapter 14, we're now going to talk about the pentose phosphate pathway, which makes this Part 3. Um, make sure that you've watched the other two videos or else, I mean, you could watch this one on its own, but I feel like it makes more sense if you've watched the other two. So here we go. The pentose phosphate pathway has a couple of other names, but we're going to stick with pentose phosphate pathway. And this pathway takes glucose 6-phosphate and produces pentose phosphates and NADPH. The whole cycle is shown on the right, and we're going to go through all the steps, talk about the enzymes, you know, the same deal that we've done for the other metabolic processes so far. The cells that are going to use this pathway primarily are ones that are rapidly dividing or ones that have a need for NADPH. So rapidly dividing cells, think about skin, um, think about hair, those kinds of things. They use ribose 5-phosphate to make RNA, DNA, and coenzymes that they need for the, you know, dividing. There are also tissues that carry out extensive fatty acid synthesis, like the liver, and they use NADPH that's provided from this pathway to do the anabolic process of creating these fatty acids. And likewise, tissues that create cholesterol, steroid hormones, they also require NADPH. So remember, way in the beginning of this chapter, we talked about, or not even this chapter, it was chapter 13, where we talked about NAD and NADP and how they're very similar structurally, but there's a preference for NADP in anabolic processes. So anything where you're kind of building up, you're making some building blocks to make larger macromolecules, you're going to be using NADP. The first step in this process uses an enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. You oxidize glucose 6-phosphate to a lactone and in the process you make NADPH. And just a word to the wise, if I'm not going into detail about a mechanism or mentioning that this is a mechanism that you should be able to write, you're not responsible for drawing the mechanism. So after we form the lactone, it's a cyclic lactone, we're going to use lactonase to catalyze the hydrolysis of the lactone to the free acid 6-phosphogluconate. Notice that we're still using magnesium for a lot of these enzymes. After you have the free acid, you have another dehydrogenase that catalyzes the oxidation and decarboxylation of 6-phosphogluconate to form ribulose 5-phosphate and another molecule of NADPH. Remember that glucose starts off, we have, it's a 6-carbon sugar. Ribulose only has 5 carbons, so that decarboxylation cuts off 1 carbon so that we've got a 5-carbon sugar instead. Now we get to kind of the stopping point for a lot of cells where there's an isomerase that can take ribulose 5-phosphate and make it ribose 5-phosphate. And so that is what you're going to see incorporated into nucleosides and nucleotides. The overall equation for this pathway is you're taking that glucose 6-phosphate and a couple of NADP and some water, and you're generating ribulose 5-phosphate, carbon dioxide, and a couple of molecules of NADPH. This ribulose 5-phosphate can either become ribose 5-phosphate with the isomerase, or there's an epimerase that will take ribulose 5-phosphate and convert it to xylulose 5-phosphate. That 
compound should sound familiar from the regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So it is a product of the pentose phosphate pathway. So that was the oxidative portion of the pentose phosphate pathway. Now we're going to look at the non-oxidative uh, reactions. And pretty much what happens here is you have the pentose phosphates that can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate so that you can go through the whole process again and make more NADPH. So this is a way to regenerate NADPH in those cells that require a lot of it. So the liver, um, adipose tissue, those kinds of things. So once you have your ribose 5-phosphate, you can create that xylose 5-phosphate, which then goes through a series of reactions with transketolase, transaldolase, and then back to that transketolase to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, eventually make fructose 6-phosphate, and then glucose 6-phosphate. So we're pretty much taking a sugar that's got five carbons, building it up to seven carbons, then reducing it down to six, and we're making some other smaller carbon, um, smaller chain carbon sugars along the way. So let's talk about the transketolase reaction. It catalyzes the transfer of a two carbon fragment from a ketose donor to an aldose acceptor. So transketolase. Sometimes these enzyme names are pretty informative. This enzyme requires TPP, just like um, you remember we had a decarboxylation that also used TPP. So the first reaction that you see with transketolase creates a seven carbon phosphorylated sugar. It also yields a glyceraldehyde three phosphate. The reaction after that requires a transaldolase and that ca uh, catalyzes the condensation of a three carbon fragment that glyceraldehyde three phosphate The next reaction is catalyzed by transaldolase. Transaldolase takes a three carbon fragment from that seven carbon sugar and glyceraldehyde three phosphate and condenses them together to form fructose six phosphate and a tetrose, which is a four carbon sugar. Follow the coloring here. Again, you're not responsible for the reaction, but the coloration of these reactions is purposeful. So the red piece ends up being added onto that glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So you can kind of follow where each of these pieces goes. So after the transaldolase reaction, we have another transketolase reaction. And what we're doing here is again, we need TPP, and we're gonna transfer another part of this xylose 5-phosphate to the tetrose and create fructose 6-phosphate and another molecule of glyceraldehyde. So we've seen that TPP a couple of times. And remember that TPP helps to stabilize, helps to generate and stabilize a carbanion that can be used to form carbon-carbon bonds.
So this is a reaction that if you were given the um, initial substrate, that you should be able to draw the product if you know the structure of the product as well, or you should be able to draw the mechanism. So it's going to go through a carbanion intermediate, which is shown here. It shows the residence as well. So with this information, you should be able to draw that reaction because we talked about it um, earlier in chapter 14. The same for the transaldolase reaction. It uses a shift base, and you're given here the resonance structure of the shift base. So with this information, you should be able to draw the mechanism for that. So as far as irreversible steps, the first step and the third step of the oxidative portion are essentially irreversible. The non-oxidative reactions are readily reversible. There's also the reductive pentose phosphate pathway, and that converts hexose phosphates to pentose phosphates. This is actually key for plants, so we're not going to really talk about it, but this is just for your knowledge. So remember that glucose 6-phosphate, one, we want to trap that glucose in the cell. That's why we phosphorylate it. But it can have a couple of different fates. It can go through glycolysis or it can go through the pentose phosphate pathway. Just like with glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, there's some regulation so that you're not spinning your wheels. And here, one of the uh, regulators is NADPH and NADP. The concentrations of these two molecules will help determine whether glucose 6-phosphate enters glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway. The first reaction, taking that glucose 6-phosphate and oxidizing it using the dehydrogenase, creates NADPH. As you continue to do that reaction, you're going to increase the amount of NADPH in the cell and that will in inevitably inhibit that glucose 6-phosphate um, dehydrogenase. So high levels of NADPH inhibit the pentose phosphate pathway. High levels of NADP will activate. What happens if you don't have thiamine? So Vitamin deficiencies are the cause of a lot of diseases. Think about scurvy. That's lack of vitamin C, ascorbic acid. So if you don't have thiamine, then you can um, potentially have beriberi or Werner-Korsakoff uh, syndrome. So thiamine is the precursor for TPP, which we've seen is very important in these major metabolic pathways. Beriberi is uh, characterized by swelling, pain, potentially paralysis, and without treatment, death. Warner-Korsakoff syndrome, problems with voluntary movements, and it's usually more common among heavy drinkers because your intestinal lining is trashed and you're not able to absorb thiamine. So even if you're eating a, a normal diet outside of the heavy alcohol intake, all that alcohol is destroying your intestinal um, lining and you can't really absorb thiamine very well. So thiamine is very important. Make sure you eat your colors. You're getting all your vitamins because those vitamins are essential for making cofactors and coenzymes to keep your body working the way it wants to be working. That's it for chapter 14. It was a long chapter. We covered a lot, but hopefully it was interesting to you. We're going to talk more in depth about some of the enzymes, look at a little bit of literature um, in addition to the normal multiple choice questions that we usually do. Thanks for watching. Make sure that you read your book with this chapter if you have the book or use other resources to help kind of fill in the gaps or to help, you know, sometimes you need just something to read and highlight and take notes on. And the lectures are great for that too but having other sources of information to help clarify things
totally help you for the remainder of the course. So with that said, good luck with your studies. Thanks for watching and stay safe.